have a Bible or have access to the scriptures or you're using the YouVersion app, you can find your way to uh, the book of 1 Peter. We're going to look at chapter 1, just a couple verses there today. And as you heard Lauren say on the video, we're actually starting into a, a series that will carry us through this month, through the Christmas season. And uh, we're going to take a break from our series that we've been walking through since this fall, which is called The Gospel Shapes and how the gospel shapes every aspect of our life. And so for the next four weeks, we're going we're gonna to kind of dive into the themes that what we recall in the Advent season, there's different themes that kind of go along in the season. And Advent is simply the term that means the anticipation or the waiting for the arrival of Jesus. And so um, I want to, this series is a, is a little bit of a shift from what we've been doing, but it's, it's, a, it's an understanding of the way that Christmas is set up for us. Is that, you know, we hear all the time that Christmas is the season of giving. Um, but that's really only half the story because the se- the Christmas is a season of receiving and then giving. Because how many know you cannot give away what you don't have? And that's the reality of what it, what, it, what it means to follow Jesus, is that we don't have anything to offer until Jesus encounters our life and transforms us, and then we're able to give away what he has given to us. And so this series is called Receiving and Giving. How in these themes that we'll talk about, and today we're going to focus in on this thing called hope, how we actually receive hope from God, and in the process of receiving that, we're not supposed to just hang on to it. God never gives us anything for us to keep for ourselves. He always gives something to us so it can flow through us, and the same thing is true as the themes that we'll go through during December, and so we're going to talk about hope and how God gives hope to us, and we'll talk about this through Jesus in a moment when we look at 1 Peter, but he gives us this thing called hope so that we can experience that, and then we can give it away to other people. Now, hope is an interesting thing because when you ask most people to to describe what hope is, most of what the definition revolves around is not really hope. It's around this thing called optimism. And optimism says that I'm kind of a a glass half full. I'm a, a positive person. I see kind of the brighter side of life. I see the positives. I don't see the negatives. And those are great. And that optimism is great. But optimism is built on and based on something of what you're trying to manufacture to create a better reality for yourself. That's usually what optimism is. Hope is completely different because hope is never based on you. It's never based on your circumstances. It's never based on your ability. True hope is always based on someone or something else. And so true hope, if you're understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus, true hope is found in who? In Jesus and what he's done for us. And it's this amazing confidence and capacity to believe that tomorrow or the future can actually be be better than today or the now that I'm living in right now. And that isn't built on you manufacturing emotion or optimism. It's built in the reality of what Jesus has done. And we'll talk about that. And that's important because for the majority of us, even though we might not articulate it, there is a, a kind of a shadow that many times lives over our life and it's called hopelessness. And it's because we see the world around us, we see our circumstances, we see our lives through the lens of our own reality, and we never see what Jesus sees. We never see what he's created, we never see what he's doing. And because of that, to really embrace hope, we have to see things differently. We have to see with a capacity we don't have. Because what's true about hope is it isn't somehow that it's manufactured, it's that you actually have the ability to see the true reality that God sees every day. It's not that it's not that it's not something there. There's something there. We just don't see it. We don't see God at work. We don't see his work in our lives until God gives us the eyes to see and the vision to see what's in front of us. So it's like seeing for the first time something that you've never seen before when the light comes on. In fact, I want to play this, this short video. This is on the news this last week of what it's like to see color for the first time. Take a look at this. What does it mean to see? Watch what happens when Jonathan Jones puts on these special high-tech glasses. <laughs> Jonathan is extremely colorblind and until this moment had never been able to imagine just how vivid even a classroom could be. His school principal, Scott Hansen, is colorblind too. They are his glasses and you hear how excited he is to share this newly discovered world. Ma, you're going to be in there too. That is so awesome. I told you it's going to be a little emotional. (laughs) A world most of us, of course, take for granted. So when we see Jonathan, with his smiles and his tears. Perhaps he reminds us that the world is indeed beautiful. Why don't you keep those for a little while? Just wait till he gets outside. Harry Smith, NBC News. Can you imagine living in a world of color and never seeing it? Until you have the right vision to see it. You and I actually don't understand this, but we live in a world of hope that we just don't see. It's the world that God is at work in. 
And that's what he wants us to see. It's the perspective that he wants us to give. That's why Jesus came. And so with that understanding this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read just verse 3 and 4 of 1 Peter chapter 1. But before I do that, before I read this, uh, just to kind of some quick context for the book of 1 Peter. Peter's writing uh, to a group of people who are followers of Jesus who pretty much lost everything in their choice to follow Jesus. They're being persecuted. They're suffering. And so they're dispersed. They're no longer be able to be together because their lives are online. They're dispersed. And so of any group of people that has kind of the right or the context to feel hopelessness, that would be that group of people. But with that understanding, listen to what Peter writes to them. In verse 3, he says this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So I just want to stop there because in those couple verses, Peter describes for you and I the kind of the context, the foundation of what hope's supposed to look like. And there's four things I want to talk about from those two verses that give us the context of hope. How do we receive hope? And really what it is, it's remembering the things that either we've forgotten or are unaware of of the way that God works in our lives. So four things to remember that re helps us to receive the kind of hope that God wants us to have. And the first one is this, remember your sin doesn't have to be the end. It never has to be the end. Look at verse three, the first part says, he says, blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Mercy, if you've been in church or even out of church, you've heard the word mercy, but we don't really understand mercy fully. We don't understand, not only is, is mercy the reality of not getting what I do deserve, which means I blow it, I fail, I mess up, and there's consequences or there's judgment that comes with that. Mercy says you get a pardon. You don't face the judgment. And that's, that's, that's hard for us to understand because we live in a culture that, in the world that the, the way the world is, is that we don't live in a merciful culture. We live in a judgmental culture. But one of the things that we also misunderstand about God is that this is not just some character trait of God. This is God's default towards humanity. The Bible is really clear on this, that mercy is the way God approaches human beings. Why is that important? Because most of us are convinced that's not the way God engages humanity. God engages humanity on the basis of judgment. That's what most of us feel. If, and if we say something different, we feel that way. And we feel in a sense because the reason we don't have hope is because we're convinced that God's primary job in his existence is to find every last failure in our life and point it out and bring judgment. So we run from God. But if, if this is a part of the nature of who God is, this is his default. This is the way he portrays his nature. In fact, that's why Jesus came into the world at Christmas. Why? Is to show mercy to humanity that Jesus would actually take our place for our, for our sin so he would set us free from our own sin and to give us freedom from death. That Jesus would do that, what? To show mercy. But we struggle with this. Because we feel as though God's trying to ruin our life, mess our life up, always getting in the way, never being fair with us, always judging us for everything. And when we feel that way, he becomes the enemy, not an ally in our life. And because of that, we don't have hope. So the last few days, if you're like me, you, we probably all OD'd on turkey and football, right? That's like America's pastime in, over Thanksgiving weekend. So I watched like more football in the last couple of days than I probably do all year. Uh, it's enjoyable. I, I have fun. And it's, it, this is kind of also becomes rivalry re weekend for a lot of college football. And so that means teams that are our rivals are playing each other. And it's interesting when you watch the games, the intensities that they're, that they're and what's going on. And, and one of the games that, that I watch a little bit of is, is known as the Iron Bowl. It's the rivalry between Alabama and Auburn. It's always a great game every year. And uh, if, if you don't know much about football, Nick Saban's the head coach of Alabama, and Alabama wins every year. And so, just to be honest, and if you're an Alabama fan, I, I apologize, but I'm just a little happy that Alabama lost yesterday, okay? Because they always win, right? But it's interesting because, uh, and this happens in most every football game, there, there's always somebody who, at the end of the game, somebody's going to hate that guy. You know what his name is? The referee, Right? Because no matter what he does or they do during the game, somebody's going to dislike something that they did at the end of the game. Usually, almost every game, they get referenced in a negative light. And that happened yesterday. So if, if you didn't see the game, Nick Saban was livid with the referees for a number of reasons. He, he, sa he said that they put an extra second back on the clock so that Auburn could make a field goal. And then at the very end of the game, they got called for a penalty, which they had 12 men on the field, and they were only supposed to have 11 men on the field. And he said they really shouldn't have called it on us. So he was mad. And why did they lose? 
Well, he'll take responsibility, but underneath the service, it's like, because the ref, like the ref had it in for us. The ref was wearing a jersey from the other side, right? All this kind of argument. And you know what's true? I think that we think that God's just the heavenly referee come to mess our lives up. It is. That's, that's, the, way, that's the way we approach God, is that he's the one that's always there to, to blow the whistle, to say, oh, you're out of bounds, or that's a foul, or that's a penalty, and not realizing what is Peter saying here? The default of God towards humanity is the opposite. It's mercy. And why is that? Because if you don't have mercy, you don't have hope because you're stuck and your failure is the end because there's no hope beyond your failure. There's no forgiveness, there's no mercy, then you only get what you deserve. But the default of God is mercy towards humanity and that's why because of his great mercy, Peter writes, that we actually have hope. Why? Because when I fail, it's not the end because God's forgiveness brings a new beginning for my life. That's the first reality of receiving hope. Second is this, as well in verse three, is remember that your past doesn't have to define your future. Your past doesn't define your future. Peter goes on and he says, is he caused us to be, and he uses this phrase, born again. Now, if you've been in church, you've heard that phrase. If you've been out, outside of church, you've probably heard that phrase. And sometimes it's like, what in the world does that phrase even mean? What does it mean to be, to be born again? Well, Jesus used that term when he was talking to a religious leader that had no category for what it meant to be brand new. All he could figure out is, how do I be good enough for God? And Jesus said, you can't be good enough for God. You have to be born again, which is an act of what God does in your life when you turn your life over to Jesus. He makes you brand new. Now, that's hard for us because we think that when we come to God, that we give him all of our sin and brokenness and all of our failure, and then he's just got to make do with what he's got, right? He's got to make something of our lives. He's got to do a, a renovation or a remodel on our lives and somehow make something of the mess that we've created in our life. That's not what being born again is. Being born again is being literally brand new. I have uh, a number of friends in the construction industry, and one friend particularly, I talk to him every once in a while, and, and when we were talking one time, he was telling me, in fact, it was, we were talking about church stuff and then even residential stuff about buildings. He said, listen, he goes, I would much rather every single scenario build new construction than do a remodel. I said, why? He said, because when you remodel something, you're always limited by what's there. He said, you always have to take into account what is in front of you to, as your process. It's, it's going to look different, but it's still going to have kind of the shape of what used to be there, the evidence of what was there. And that's why you remember, you know, the, the whole makeover kind of movement where houses were being made over on TV shows. And, of, and when they first started doing that, it was more of modifications. And then by season three, it was what? Completely shred the thing down to the foundation, brand new house, right? Why? Because it's easier and it's better to, what, to build brand new than to renovate. I think that some of us think that when we come to God that he's limited by what he has to work with. He's limited by what's already there. God is never limited by our sin and brokenness. And that means that whatever thing that we've done or experienced or it's happened to us in the past does not disqualify us from the future that God has for us. Never. God doesn't have to try to figure out how to undo your past to make your future work. He literally creates you from the ground up into a new person. You're born again. Because if you and I aren't born again, what are, we, what are we missing? We're missing hope. Why? Because I'm still gonna be stuck somewhere in the past. Something from my past will still shape my future and I will never be what God wants me to be. But if I'm brand new, nothing from my past will ever determine my future. That's what gives us hope, that tomorrow actually can be better than today. And then there's a third reality, of receiving hope, and that is to remember that death isn't the end, but it's actually the beginning. So in the, we're going in verse three, it says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from Jesus Christ from the dead. So this, I love what Peter inserts the word living. He doesn't just say any hope. He says a living hope. What is he talking about? He's referencing the fact that when Jesus was born as a human being, he came for a purpose. He came to live a perfect life and then die a death for us and through his perfection rise from the dead. He's the only human being ever to live in this world who is no longer dead today, who does not walk the planet right now, but he's ascended back to the Father and he's still alive. So Peter's saying, listen, your future, your life, your eternity, everything of who you are, if you follow Jesus, is built on a hope that is alive. And if, there, if the hope, your hope is built on what's alive, that means that there is no end to it. It doesn't come to an end and say, okay, well, that's the end of it. Because Jesus has overcome death. That means that if you're a follower of Jesus, you understand this reality. Death is not the end. 
Death is not a period. Death is actually a comma. It's into the next life. It's into eternity. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that shapes our life. But when you choose to follow Jesus, you have a living hope because at every point where you think you've reached a dead end, including the very end of your life, where you've reached the end, there's always this little voice that comes along through the Holy Spirit that Jesus whispers to you the same thing he said to you the moment you gave your life to him, which is this, follow me. Even when you get to the end of this life, Jesus will say, follow me through death to life. Because he's been there, because he's done it. So I want to play a, a short commercial for you. This is not an endorsement for Nissan. Okay, this is just the fact that I like the way the phrase they use and the idea that even when you think you got to the end of the journey, when you follow Jesus, it's never the end. It's always the beginning of something new. Take a look at this. Road closed? There's a guy. Excuse me, Glacier Point? Follow me! Follow me! Keep up, keep up, keep up. Look, he's right there! Wow. Crystal Falls? Follow me! The Nissan Pathfinder. Nissan. Innovation that excites. I think Nissan needs to give credit to Jesus. I think he said, said those words just a little bit before that commercial came out. So, but the concept is this. You reach a dead end, and I love there, there's a dead end. They're like, oh, but there's a guy. And then they turn to the guy. Yeah, we reach a dead end in this life. There's a guy. His name's Jesus. And what he provides for us is that there's always an opportunity beyond this life to go into the next life. And we'll talk about how that sh changes everything about the way we live in this world, knowing that death is not the end. It's actually a doorway into the eternity that God has for all of us. But then there's a final point of, of remembering that actually produces and gives us hope in life, and that's this. It's remember that your next, the next life can be better than this one. Because Peter goes on, he says this, he says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, it's... it's it's undefiled and unfading. It's kept in heaven for you. What, what is Peter saying? It's safe. It's secure. It's a guarantee. It's not a possibility. It's not hoping it's going to happen. It is a 100% guarantee that cannot be changed that when you give your life to Jesus and you die in this world, you will go into eternity with him. That is determined by him, not by us. And that's a guarantee. That means I don't have to live in fear. What is that like? Well, that's living with a certain kind of confidence that you know the end before you even get there. So can you imagine what it would be like it, that you're so secure and so, you, you know what's gonna happen that you can live with this quiet confidence that it doesn't matter what happens in my life, I know the way this thing's gonna end because God has already determined that because he's in control of my life and therefore I can live with hope. It's not like, a, well, let me use another football analogy, okay? One of the things, please don't tell me if you're this kind of person because I'll ruin it for you. I have people who come to me and they like to record sporting events. I've never gotten this before, okay? I like to watch them live. There's just something about them being live, but people will come to me like, okay, I'm recording the game. Don't say anything. It's like turn all notifications off on your phone. Don't, you know, nothing. And I've actually experienced that to the points of frustration where it's like you, you, you got to know what's going on. But, but what's interesting is that, that people love to do that. They love to record it, and then even though the outcome is already over by the end of the game, and they're still somewhere in the middle, it's going to happen. In fact, I have a, a pastor friend who, this is way back when, before cable and everything, he said he told, told a story about how that he and a friend used to get together every Monday night and watch Monday Night Football. And this is when you didn't have, like, uh, you didn't have a DVR, you couldn't record it, you, didn't, you just, you watched what was on. Remember those days? Like, what was that? Some of you are like, what are you even talking about, Pastor Sean? So, but the, this, so what they would do is they would get together, and he figured out, though, that the, that the telecast they were watching was one hour delay because of time zone from where the game was actually happening. Just happened to be where they were. So he would figure out how to get access to the game ahead, an hour ahead of what they were watching. And so he used it to his advantage. So they'd sit down, and he'd, he'd certainly, he goes, you know, I think on this play, they're going to throw a bomb, like 60 yards. Guy's going to catch it. It's going to be spectacular. His friend's like, Not, no way. Boom, it happens. <laughs> He's like, I'm just good at guessing. I'm just good at guessing. He's like, I think this one is going to be like a, an eight-yard loss. Quarterback's going to get sacked. He's like, there's no way. Sure enough, boom, he gets sacked. And he did this. He told me he did this for a couple years, and the guy didn't figure it out. <laughs> he just thought the guy was brilliant, you know? But he never bet money because he was a good guy. He didn't make any bets on any plays, which he could have probably made a lot of money because he was a pastor. You don't do those kind of things, right? <laughs> but he knew what was going to happen. Therefore, he had the confidence to know what, was, what he could do. And I think 
There's something to be said about that. If what P Peter's saying here is that what Jesus has done has secured eternity for you if you follow Jesus, then you know what the end's gonna be. It's already determined. That means you and I can live life knowing that at the end, we win because Jesus already won. And that changes the way I live my life. That means I don't have to be afraid of the outcome of the end of the game. Why? Because I already know. In fact, we know that people love to watch games that have already happened. There's a whole network, it's called ESPN Classic, where people will watch games from 25 years ago, even though they know how it's gonna end. Why? Just to be a part of it again. That's the way we're supposed to live our lives. That we know the end, and we should live with this confidence that even though when your team's in the fourth quarter down by 25 points, they're still gonna win the game. Why? Because the outcome has already been secured. That's what it means to have hope in Jesus, is that the outcome is already secure, and I live with that kind of confidence. So that is the receiving side of what God gives to us when Jesus comes at Christmas. He brings this gift of hope to us that is secure, that is guaranteed, that changes the way we see the world around us. Now, here's the reality. If we have that, that is way too good to keep to ourselves. Way too good to give to ourselves. We, have, we should be able to give away the hope that God has given to us. How do we give that hope away? How do we give hope to people? Three things I want to just mention here that how we live lives that help people to experience hope around us. The first one is this, to live mercifully. If the nature of God, his disposition towards humanity is mercy, then it should be the same for us who choose to follow him that we should be people who are of mercy. Jesus actually says this in Luke 6, verse 36. He says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. What is mercy? Mercy is saying, listen, you deserve this, but I'm not gonna give you that. And mercy is a huge challenge for us because we live by default, we live judgment towards other people. You see in our culture, most people in our culture, what ends up happening, especially with we are so connected with social media and phones and television and everything in the internet. When somebody fails, everybody knows about it. And what's happened in our culture is that when somebody fails, we define them by their greatest moment of failure for the rest of their lives. Even though what they've done may be horrific, there's no place in our culture to say, I extend mercy to that person. I pardoned them from what, for what they did. And then it even gets more difficult at a relational, and I had so many conversations between services with, with people on this one, that if God shows mercy towards us, then we're supposed to show mercy towards people who have offended us, people who've wronged us. And this is a huge thing, because what does mercy do? Mercy liberates. It sets somebody free. And if you, in your life, you've experienced some kind of violation or you've been offended by somebody else and you hang on to that offense, there's two things that are really going on. The primary one is that now you're holding that person hostage in the moment of their failure, never giving them an opportunity to ever be anything different than when they failed. But you know what you're also doing to yourself? You're poisoning yourself with bitterness towards that person. So you both lose. So see, the, here's the reality. If, if we don't live with mercy, then nobody around us has hope of ever being anything than they were when they failed. But if we are people of mercy that have the capacity to forgive somebody when they failed, that means that people actually have hope that when I fail relationally or when I fail in my life, it's not the end. Why? Because somebody has chosen to forgive me. And this is a huge one. We get offended and we hang on to stuff for our entire lives and won't let it go. But if we extend mercy, I had someone come to me and tell me that they had held something against somebody for years and years and years and years. They hated somebody because what they had done to their family. And they prayed and the Lord helped them to release that person. And, and she told me that when she was sharing this with me, she said, when I, it was amazing when I forgave that person, I, I, f I forgot the, the weight of what they had done to my family. I no longer carried that with me anymore because I had forgiven them and, and, and been shown mercy to them. There's, there are people around us every day that need hope. They need the hope that they can actually change. They need hope that there's another opportunity to do something different, even though they failed in the past. And there's a second, a second way of giving hope, not only living with mercy, but also l to live compassionately, to extend compassion to those who see their circumstances as the end, that we, we are people who live this way. In fact, listen to what Jesus says in the story he tells, we call it the prodigal son. 
which is the story of the son who took a third of his dad's wealth as his inheritance to go live his own life. And then after losing everything and squandering all of his dad's wealth, he crawls back to his dad. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It says, so he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. That is so opposite of what we expect. If your son or your daughter takes a third of your wealth and goes and wastes it all and then wants to come back into your household, how do you think most of us would treat them? Not with open arms. Maybe at first, but then you're gonna earn back, you're gonna pay back what you, what you stole. But what does this father do with mercy? He opens and with compassion, he embraces his son to live compassion. Wh- why did his son need compassion? Because just a few verses earlier, it says he came to his senses. Why? Because he's sitting in a pig pen. He's fighting with pigs for the slop that they get, and that's all he has, can, can get to eat. He's reaching the end of his, his circumstances. He can't see any future beyond where he's at, and so he realizes, maybe there's hope with my dad. We are surrounded with people all the time that have reached the end, and their circumstances tell them so. And they have no hope of getting beyond where they're at unless somebody comes along with a sense of compassion for their life and says there's hope because there's people who care about you. Let me just give you a couple of scenarios to unfold. One of them is just my own personal confession of my, my ability to be very human and not very happy with my humanity. Anybody ever disappointed with your humanity? So this last week we had Laundry Love, which is always, I always look forward to Laundry Love. And we've been, our community group is doing it for a number of years now. So we have great relationships in our laundromat where we care for people by, by not only paying for the laundry, but building relationship and being present and, and even doing things outside of that to care for them. And, and so this last week, um, we've gotten to know a number of people in the laundromat and there's uh, some, some homeless guys that come in and one of the guys who comes in almost every time, we got to know him. And so I kind of hear his journey, his story, and, and we've g- kind of talked about what he's walked through in his life and prayed for him a few times and, and we've had a pretty good relationship and so we were winding kind of the night down and, and uh, we were wrapping up and things were kind of shutting down it sort of far, as far as our role in the laundromat. And so as he was packing stuff up, I was helping him get all his belongings into a bag. And, and so he said, yeah, I got I to gotta, I gotta transport kind of in two waves because I'm on my bike and I don't have, I don't have, I can't carry everything where I'm going. He said, I said, well, wh- what are you doing tonight? He goes, well, I know it's going to rain. And he, go, I, I, he said, I can't go back to my camp that I have. It's, and he kind of told me the area. I won't tell you where it is because he doesn't want to get busted by the cops. He said, I can't go there. He goes, it's too wet. He goes, I have tarps, but I, I know that I, by the morning, because it's supposed to rain, I'll be, exa- I'll be freezing because it'll be wet. And So he goes, but I, there's a shopping center I go to, and there's an area behind there I can kind of hide in, and I can stay dry for the night. So he goes, I'm, I'm going to head there. And he goes, I'm going to head there, and then I'm going to leave my stuff here. And, you know, because most people in the laundromat kind of know each other on that night. And so he goes, well, maybe someone will kind of look out for it. He goes, but I'm not quite sure. And, and so I'm like, yeah, well, I'm sure they'll be fine. They'll, they'll look out for your laundromat, either your laundry, and you can go ride your bike and then come back. And so I'm hauling all the stuff out and I get the stuff into our car and then I get in the car and I'm driving away and I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? I'm driving home to my nice warm house to sleep in my nice warm dry bed. And this guy's having to take two trips on his bicycle to make sure he can stash all his belongings in a place that's dry where he's going to be cold all night. And I couldn't take 10 minutes to take his stuff in my car and drive it a mile or two away. By the way, the story doesn't end like, oh, I drove back and I helped him. No, I didn't. I didn't. And it's bothered me ever since that because I felt like the Lord presented me someone who needed compassion. Hey, you gotta pay for their laundry. I helped him pack up his laundry. I said, happy Thanksgiving. But I didn't do the very thing that he needed. How many times in our life were we faced with someone who needs compassion? to go that one extra step to help them to see their circumstance is not the end. You know, there's another group of people that we're, we're actually focusing on this Christmas season. One is obviously Christmas shop with helping people who are under-resourced in our community, but, but we're talking about Syrian refugees and helping their children this Christmas. And you've heard about it over the last couple weeks. Working with our missionaries in Turkey to help them sponsor an event that's going to actually care for the needs of Syrian refugees coming out of their own country with literally mo- some of them with the clothes on their back. We have a deep connection with Haiti as a church. Many of us have been there. We support Haiti. We send teams there all the time. We have a disconnect with Syria. 
Because Syria pops up in the news almost to the point where we forget about what's going on there. Syria has been in civil war for years. Their own government has tried to kill its own, their own people. And so literally by the thousands, if not millions, as they try to head out of the Middle East, they go through Turkey and they end up in Istanbul where our missionaries are. And so there's these refugees who literally, because of their life being in danger, they've left their belongings, their house, their job, their family. And now they're in a foreign country in Turkey that Turkey doesn't even want them there. Do you remember what happened a month ago? Turkey invaded Syria to create a buffer to keep the Kurds under control in Syria. And some of them have migrated into Turkey. And these are the people that we're trying to help through our missionaries there to care for their basic needs this Christmas. There's a group of people that needs compassion. Now, I don't know if you, you've given or haven't. I don't even know what our total is yet and what we've given. But if you haven't given to help support what we're doing globally through Syria, I, I encourage you, if not challenge you, to ask the Lord, what should I give? Because if, it become, if we reach the goal and go more than they need, I guarantee they will use it for wonderful things because in the last six or seven years, they've planted multiple churches with different ethnicities in Turkey to reach people coming out of the Middle East. It is worth every dime we can invest in the area. Why? Because here's a group of people who feel like they've gotten to the end because of their circumstances. But what is the hope for those people? Jesus is the hope through the church that's present in Turkey. And we get to partner from thousands of miles away to be a part of that. That's how we give compassionately. So to give people hope, they need to know that there's somebody else who cares deeply for them and that their circumstances are not the end. And then there's a final thing. The final reality of giving hope is to actually live eternally. So the first two have more to do the way we treat people, mercy, compassion. But this third one really has to do with what I was talking about earlier. If our inheritance is guaranteed, it's secure, it's undefiable. You can't get to it because it's guaranteed because of what Jesus has done. That means that we live with perspective that nobody else lives with, and that is this. Death is not the end. Death is the beginning. Therefore, death should not be feared. Does that mean that we have a death wish and we go looking to die? No. But we never allow fear, the fear of death, to control us from living out the mercy and the compassion that God wants us to live in the world around us. What gives somebody hope is when they see somebody who's not afraid to die. That is, has a hope that's anchored in something beyond themselves. Listen to Paul's writings in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, To them God has chosen to make known the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, if you've received Jesus, the hope of what? Glory. The hope of what? Being in God's glorious presence after we die. That is given to us. That's the hope that we have. If we have that hope, then we have nothing to lose. We have nothing to lose. That's why Paul, in his writings in the New Testament, says the crazy idea that for a follower of Jesus, to die is actually to gain. Yeah, it's kind of quiet in here. You're like, no, 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 no. Paul was on drugs or something. He wasn't thinking clearly. No, Paul was thinking clearly. He had the, he had the lens that saw the hope of the future. Well, what if this is really true? What if I'm a follower of Jesus and actually when I die, I actually gain? Why? Because I'm no longer bound in this world by my brokenness and my frailty and my humanity, but now I'm free to be in the presence of God forever. That should be a motivator for me. In fact, the great evangelist and revivalist George Whitfield said this. He said, you are immortal until your work is done. What was he saying? If we truly believe that God is sovereign and he's secured our future, if we give our life to Jesus then that mean, g- means God determines when you live and when you die. He's in charge of all that. And that means that you're not going to leave this planet a day before God wants you to. We always say fra- phrases like God took them before their time. God doesn't take anybody before the time. It's God's time. In fact, in Hebrews, the Bible actually calls death an appointment. It's in God's calendar. You may not have it in yours, but it's in God's calendar. And if that's true, that means that if there's a sense of immortality to me until God says, okay, you're done, that means I can't lose. And if I live my life that way, people around me start to realize, okay, there's something different about you because for the majority of people in our culture, we live every single day trying to avoid pain, suffering, and death by all means. That's how we live our lives. We are driven by what? Comfort and safety. We don't want danger or risk because we value those things. But if I am somebody who's a follower of Jesus, then I can give my life away and I can lose my life and I still win. But I don't know if we believe that. And if we don't believe that, guess what we don't have? We don't have hope. 
The only hope we have is what? This world. So I live to the fullest I can for my 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. And then when the end comes, the party's over. But if I really believe this, when the end comes, the party begins. And if I live that way, then I live what? I live risk, danger. I'm not afraid. God calls us to that. Please hear me. I'm not trying to offend anybody, and I have not read anybody's Christmas letter from our church, but this is the time of year where our mailbox gets stuff filled with like people, friends and family that we've known for years will send us the annual update of what happened in their life. Anybody get those letters? Some of us send those letters. And it's great. You, you kind of get to catch up on what's happened in people's lives and how their kids are doing and what transitions have happened, all this stuff. And, and as I read those every year, not all of them, but I would say a good majority of them kind of follow the same script. They kind of give an update if there was any transition of what happened, if there was a job change or a change in housing or whatever, uh, that's in there. Kind of highlight, you know, the kids. The kids are, you know, doing great in school and they're on the honor roll and they're playing in the band and they're on the basketball team and all these great things. And we did this and this is the great vacation we went on. Here's a couple pictures to make you jealous, right? That kind of thing. This is, this is the normal script. I've read a ton of them. And I think they're great, but you know, one of the things that's interesting is that 90% that of those come from people who are Christ followers, but I haven't read one yet that says, man, this has been the best year of my life because I risked everything and faced danger and went through suffering, but people came to know Jesus and God fulfilled his purpose through my life. I haven't read that one yet, but I've read, got a new house, got a promotion, got a raise, moved to a safer part of the country, Got away from terrible California with all those taxes and liberals, right? That's what we're all about, right? No offense, sorry, I probably stepped over a line there. That's just what everybody says when they leave California, so. But, but where's, the, where's the letter that would come from like the Apostle Paul, who, if you, by the way, you wanna read his Christmas update, go ahead and read the second book of Corinthians and the parts where he talks about suffering. Because he would say, oh yeah, this year's been great. I was shipwrecked, I was starving, I was cold. I was stoned. And I'm not talking about from weed. He was stoned from actual rocks. <laughs> he went through all that. He was rejected by his own people. He suffered. And it was the best year of his life. Why? Because people came to know Christ and the kingdom of God extended through him. I say all that not to be extreme and again, not to offend anybody. But if we have hope, we should be living differently than anybody else on the planet. Because I don't want somebody to live the same life I live if I'm afraid to die. If I'm, and, I, and I control and I, and I make sure that nothing ever bad happens to me or my family or the people that I love. Why? Well, never want that to happen. I don't want to risk anything. I don't want anybody to emulate that. I want somebody to come along and say, there's something that you understand. You know the end somehow, and you're not afraid for the end to come. You live as though if you die, you gain. I haven't had anybody say that to me yet. It's because I haven't lived to the the potential of what God has for me. So I'm going to ask the worship team, they're going to come and join us, and we're going to conclude with a time of communion together, and I want to highlight what we're about to do and the importance of that. I'm convinced that if you choose to be a follower of Jesus and you understand the concept of hope, not only will your life change, but the lives of people around you will change dramatically because they'll see what you have and they'll desire the same thing. And so in a moment, what we're going to do is we'll go into a song, and there's four tables or stations uh, positioned around the room, two in the back and two in the front, that have the elements. They have the bread and the cup, and Jesus actually is the one who started this 2,000 years ago. Just before he went to the cross, he, he explained to his followers, he said, I'm doing this, what I'm about to do, I want you to do this, this thing that we're about to do, he said 2,000 years ago, to remember. To remember what? Remember what he was about to do which is to give his life on the cross for our brokenness, our failure, and our sin. So Jesus actually took two elements. He took bread and a cup. Bread is a symbol of his body, which was going to be broken. He was going to suffer miserably. And then the cup, which was a symbol of his blood, which was, means he literally died. He, he gave his life for us. And he said, I do this to establish a new covenant with you. The old covenant was based on this reality. You have to be good enough for me. You have to obey the law. You have to be perfect or you're rejected. The new covenant is not based on you. The new covenant is based on me, on Jesus. 
that I, I give my life as the ultimate sacrifice for you. So this is not based on how good you are. It's based on how good I am to you. And so Jesus reminded his followers and said, listen, every time you get together, do this to remember. To remember. Why would Jesus say remember? Because we always forget. And the same thing is true with hope. The reason we don't live with hope is not because we never had hope in our life. It's because we forgot. We become hopeless. Why? Because we forget God in the midst of our circumstances. And all we see is what right is in, what's in front of us. We don't see the lens that he wants to put on our eyes that sees the beauty in front of us of his hope through our circumstances. The only thing that gets you to see that perspective is when you see through the sacrifice of Jesus. Because his sacrifice changes everything. Everything that sin has touched or influenced or broke or destroyed, Jesus' death undoes it, heals it, forgives it, transforms it, including our very lives. So in the next few moments, when, when we go into a song, you can go to the different tables. By the way, in the corner here is gluten-free if you need that option. But when you go to the tables and you're taking those elements, you do this with a sense of understanding. You're saying, listen, all the places of failure and brokenness that have led me to believe there is no hope beyond this moment, these things remind me that Jesus gave his life for me and he loves me and there is a tomorrow and tomorrow will be better than today. That's what the cross means. That's what this sacrifice means for us. Would you close your eyes in just a moment? I'm gonna pray, but just with your eyes closed. I said a phrase a number of times this morning that I want you to know is very important. I said, if you've chosen to be a follower of Jesus, there are people across this room that that's, that's a commitment and a choice that you've made in your life, but maybe, maybe you're here and that's a choice or a commitment that, that you've never fully made in your life. You've heard about the concept of who Jesus is, you're understanding a little bit more, but you've never made that decision like in that commercial when the guy says, follow me, you know that something in you has heard that voice before that says, follow me, but you've not quite done that yet. And today, you know that God may be stirring something in you that he's trying to draw you to follow Jesus. And the reason you would follow Jesus is because through our own decisions, our own doing, our desire to be our own God and to make our own decisions on what's right and wrong or good and bad, we've eliminated God from our lives and found ourselves lacking, broken, flawed. And then Jesus comes along and says, if you'll choose to follow me and let me be the Lord of your life, the God over your life, to determine what is best for you, then I can come and begin to bring hope to the places of hopelessness in your life. I can bring forgiveness to the point, point, points of sin and failure in your life. I can bring a sense of newness to places where you feel like there isn't hope for tomorrow but it means that you make a commitment to say, I'm no longer gonna be my own God. I'm not gonna call the shots. I'm gonna surrender to Jesus because he's the only one that is capable of leading my life better than me. And if that's something that you desire today, and I'm gonna pray in a moment. And as I pray, I ask you, you just talk to God because guess what? He hears your thoughts, he hears your words. And you tell him, I choose to follow Jesus today. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have made a way for us to actually have hope in this life, hope for the next life. Through your death and your resurrection, you have power over death, therefore you are our living hope. And so today, Lord, I pray where there is hopelessness and discouragement that you would bring hope. Help us to see with the eyes that you want us to see the world around us. And then Lord, would you let us also, as we receive that hope, would you allow us to see the people around us who are in just as desperate need of the hope as we are. And they will be people who live with mercy and compassion, with an eternal perspective that risks all to follow you. So Holy Spirit, would you come and work in our hearts and our minds in these moments as we, Jesus, we remember your sacrifice for us.